long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known in this realm as Jaime and Fuego, and if it please you, join me here once more for the sixth installment of the Road to the Dark Tower movie, a series inspired here on the horror show by Mr. Bev Vinson, who wrote a fantastic book entitled The Road to the Dark Tower. Yes, that's where I got the idea, so all hail Cy Vincent and uh, the inspiration that he tossed within me. Um, I have done every Dark Tower entry up until this point, and that includes the one through the keyhole and the lost story because of the fact that a lot of my friends who have read the Dark Tower are not aware that in Everything's Eventual, there was a story entitled The Little Sisters of Euloria, which was also done by Marvel Comics at one point. So, here we finally arrive at what I like to call the stretch run with Song of Susanna, the sixth book in the franchise, and this is one that initially when I was powering through all these Stephen King books, because when I realized everything tied in to the tower, I was like, I'm gonna read everything in its published order. And so even though I'd already read Pet Cemetery, It, The Stand, stuff like that, I went all the way back to the beginning with Carrie and started reading through everything. I only have the Bill Hodges trilogy left. I jumped ahead to Revival. I also read Wendy's Button Box already. You can see review of uh, that actually from just about a month ago here on The Horror Show. But When I initially read Song of Susanna, I must say, not impressed. I was wanting the story to essentially go in a particular direction, and it did not. It only increased the meta aspect that they kind of hinted at at the end of Wolves of the Kala, and I also didn't like the whole self-referential aspect of stories manifesting themselves and becoming reality and all that with, you know, the, the wolves at the end and the Doctor Doom aspect and the Harry Potter schneeps or seam or whatever the hell they were called and uh, various other things. And so I really wasn't liking the direction that the story was going, especially after adoring three and four. And even when King jumped back to win through the keyhole between four and five, I, I just love that period of Roland and not just, you know, the younger stuff, but also the modern quartet in that particular time period. And so I really, as I film this on June 19th, cannot even grasp the irony since it was not initially intended. I'm doing all of these retro reviews because of the fact that on August 4th, the Dark Tower film is coming out. And so I was like, well, I'll do one in January, one in February, one in March, one in April, one in May, and those have all been up. But for this to be going up on June 19th, when the accident itself is so prominently featured at the end of this book, Just in case you didn't know, and you probably shouldn't even be watching this entry if you didn't know and haven't been reading any of the other books or seen any of my other entries so far, but on June 19th was when King was run over by some idiot who was not paying attention and, you know, tending to his dogs jumping for meat in the back or whatever the hell the explanation was, and that man is no longer with us, you know. No loss, as King would probably say, but... It is just such irony on June 19th to be releasing this video after rereading this and being reminded of the particular day. And the question that I posed at my Dark Tower panel at the Phoenix Comic Con, I must pose once again. How different would this series be if not for the fact that King nearly lost his life without having it completed? I would say vastly. I don't think that the number 19 would be featured so prominently or so much of the other mythology, some of the meta stuff that became super, super prevalent because, minor spoiler, Stephen King himself shows up in this book. Yeah, you know, all these different alternate realities and stuff that they've been jumping to, different hints and clues and stuff like that about maybe even where Eddie came from and where Jake came from and where Susanna came from. They all came from New York, right? So it's all the same New York. No, not necessarily. And uh, is it the one that we know, the one where time passes naturally, where the crushing of the beams, you know, we're down to only two as we find out in this story. It's not the same, you know? There is, it's, it's almost like this amazing movie synchronicity that I have to make mention of where the fact that you can jump back and forth through time and to not the most keen perception, you may think everything is the same, but There's slight nuances, little differences here and there. Where's Co-op City? You know, oh, it's 
in Brooklyn or it's you know where there's there's little bits that are given away that are very intriguing and just show that you know you can have infinite alternate realities and some may be very similar and then others vastly different and it's a book where the appreciation and just the understanding of what he was trying to do was not there right off the bat you know I was just like Okay, King, you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of Wolves of the Kala, but I love the stuff with Callahan because I loved Salem's lot, and so it brought it all back, and for the longest time, I said that Song of Susanna was my least favorite in the entire series. Now, upon a reread for the first time, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna discredit that distinction, but I will say that I gained a new appreciation for a lot of what it had to say, even though it's one of the leanest and meanest, and feels very much so like a a book of preparation for that seventh monster volume that comes right after this that you guys can see on July 19th making its debut, but uh, it's it gives so much information about the mythology that when I think I was skimming through in quick reading, in all honesty, for plot points and just saying, okay, yeah, so they're gonna jump through the cave after Susanna, you know, and she's fled with Black 13 and they, you know, they know she's gone to New York and they don't know what time period and the man you're gonna help them, you know, because they're so appreciative after helping them, you know, save Calibre and Sturgis and whatnot. And, they're sending Callahan and Jake to one spot, and they're sending Eddie and Roland to another spot, but they don't get sent to the spots that they're thinking they're going to. And, uh, you know, Susanna is dealing with all the stuff of wrestling with Mia as she's prego with the chap, and she learns some of the mythology about how this actually, you know, came to be within her. Ties in with the Oracle, ties in with the stuff in Book 3, where Susanna has to get on down with that demon you know at the at the portal so they can let Jake get back over and this is where I'm trying not to get too spoilerific I thought that the expansion of the stuff with Mia and Susanna when they jump over to Discordia the castle you know and uh, where you know they're in Fredic and so on people who have read the book will be all with me on this and if you haven't read the book just yet and you're just kind of testing the waters and you've already read a few up to five perhaps whatever this is where I have to say pay attention to the spots where there is a palaver with Susanna and Mia because it sheds some of the most interesting light about the entire mythology of Midworld and, you know, the Age of Magic and the Age of Men with Machines and all this other stuff and the Discordia that, you know, was there before any of this stuff formed and before the beams were put down to, you know, keep the tower in place and before the Red Death, you know, went and destroyed so much and that there's just so much cool world building and explanation about things that I had legitimate questions about. Now, King doesn't give all of the answers. He's very much about giving you a few things and then just kind of leaving you hanging, unfortunately. But yeah, just the, the journey of Roland and Eddie separate and, uh, you know, Callahan and Jake separate, even though we don't really get to them till till near the end. It's, it's very much, as I said already, and a novel that lays the groundwork for the finale, but does it in a way that, as I talked a lot of smack about this novel to many, many people from time to time, oh, it's boring, it's the worst entry in there, and the verdict is out once again, you know, because I was also critical of book seven. I do definitely think that the accident put King on a different trajectory because he didn't have outlines anymore, or, you know, so he says in this, and so he was just kind of letting gone speak through him and the inspiration and all of that which is kind of cool and interesting to think about and so the bits in Maine are intriguing and the meeting with King is interesting I guess but the the best bit that I had forgotten about is the fact that there are certain forces that have been trying to stop him from writing this story you know the Dark Tower for a very long time and that interestingly met away and then I had also uh, kind of forgotten about a lot of that discourse with Susanna and Mia. Um, Jake and Oi and Callahan don't play as big of a part in this. They kind of have their finale and wrap up in the next book. But aspects of this that I didn't really dig as much are still there. The stuff with trying to get the, you know, Lob with the Rose from Calvin Tower and tracking him into Maine, especially after Callahan gave him the warning in Book 5, and so he's in hiding from the Balazar guys. Um, Jack Andalini and some henchmen of Balazar, they show back up. It felt very just kind of callback to the second book, and I know 
cause a wheel and everything in a circular motion comes back, but I did feel like the beat of that attack and ambush and everything was just too much like drawing of the three for me to really get as into it and I felt like certain ideas were being recycled. So yeah, this was hearkening back to just some of the plot points that I wasn't as big of a fan of when they showed up in Dark Tower 2 and when, you know, they were brought back in 5 and, you know, the fact that, oh, they, you know, they're working for Sombra and for North Central and everything. It just, I don't know, it, it still doesn't work for me. However, I gained a new appreciation for the stuff with Prego Susanna that I wasn't the biggest fan of upon the initial read and just the additional aspects of the storytelling and backstory and whatnot that we didn't really get previously, I thought were were very intriguing. Um, but yeah, the Tet versus Sombra that you see in the video game on Stephen King's website and everything, I'm just not the biggest Fan. And that's the thing, we do eventually get to the end game of the chap is going to be born and it ties in some loose ends and gives some explanation that while I find interesting, doesn't doesn't necessarily work for me. And uh, But once again, a new appreciation. I, I found stuff in this novel that I liked, especially some of the character discourse and uh, it, I still don't like Calvin Tower, you know, Deepna is the dude that people like of that duo. Um, you do get to meet a guy named John Cullum who helps them out throughout the way and, uh, you know, but just too much recycled stuff, too many beats that I wasn't too intrigued by. The stuff with Sayer though is interesting, especially since we know he is going to be in this August 4th film, and so when you eventually arrive and get a vampiric presence, a little bit more of the low men, there is some hints at um, them having something to do with the seventh book, and you also meet a new like weird hybrid race called the Tahin in this and they're they've almost got like bird and monster kind of like creature heads with human bodies so I don't know they're they're expanding just the array of antagonists in a lot of ways which is kind of cool and so at the end of the day this is a book that well, I found a lot more merit in it when I was reading it for the second time because, as I've said, I've reread Wastelands and Wizard and Glass and the first four quite a bit. Went, went through the keyhole, I've read like three or four times now, but I was just never as big on five through seven. I do feel like the series took a different course of action after King's accident, and I mean, just the implement of 19 alone and the fact that he went back and redid the first book shows that his accident changed everything. And King has always been one of these guys that writes based on personal, just interaction, inspiration, and stuff like that. Whether it's, you know, he's going on his walk and who's that rap tapping on my bridge for it? Or when he was living right next to that road where, you know, there's a pet cemetery beside it because of the fact that so many pets were killed by the semis that were going up and down this. And it's kind of funny. He actually references that in this book. So. This book gets so insanely meta, you can tell where a show like Supernatural, for instance, took possibly some of its uh, you know, inspiration for just making things just spin on their head as far as being self-referential and self-aware and all that other stuff. And so, yeah, at, at, at the end of the day, Song of Susanna, it's still maybe my least favorite, but I have to reread Seven, which I felt was a cop-out in a lot of ways, and I know a lot of Dark Tower fans will probably be upset to hear me say that, but I did find it much more rewarding, enriching, and interesting this particular time through, and I also have to mention the fact that the structuring was so different than any other King uh, Dark Tower book, and not since Drawing of the Three, the second book where there was the shuffle and reshuffle when he was just amassing his new quartet has stuff been structured in such a distinctively different manner. As opposed to being chapters, you have stanzas. And so stanza one with a subtitle, stanza two, and it was always followed by the, you know, come Kamala stuff and, you know, interestingly rhymed this chant of sorts, which harkens back to his time in Caliburn Sturgis. And anytime I hear come Kamala, I always think of you know, Roland doing his dance and that, uh, you know, Bernie Wrightson artistry, which was just so awesome. So yeah, we, we learned a lot more about the Dark Tower as far as the mid-world mythology. We learned a lot more about what happened before. And even though I don't like where the story went in a lot of ways, it's still well-written. It's still Stephen fucking King, for God's sake, you know? And 
He is my personal favorite writer. He's the guy who lives up to his name consistently, sometimes two or three times a year. So it, it's a crucial part in what became the tower. Um, one of my only gripes is the fact that, and they even mentioned this in the book, he went away from the story so many times because of the fact that he was waiting for the wind to start blowing in his head, as Toby says, or as, you know, as the, the inspiration came to him. And for these last three volumes, he didn't do that. He did them boom, 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 as opposed to letting the story sit and him as the word slinger, as uh, Roland calls him at one particular time, which I found so insanely amusing, you know, as the word slinger. He forced those shots, man, you know, he just really went for it in these last couple entries and probably because of the fact that he saw, he, he saw the realization of his own mortality and he was just kind of like, if I don't finish this now, who the hell knows when I'm going to if I just keep putting it off and doing multiple novels in between and stuff. And so perhaps it's good that he finally got that monkey off his back, you know, just like Eddie had, you know, going into book two. So. Yeah, I mean, for better or for worse, this is how The Dark Tower begins to draw to a close. And I'm actually really looking forward to rereading Seven because I'm thinking maybe I will see some things in that that I didn't appreciate properly the first time either, just like with Song of Susanna. So, in any event, guys, I have been Jaime in Fuego. I extend a grande gracias. I hope that we have been well met. Do not forget the faces of your fathers and your mothers, especially here on Father's Day on June 19th. Well, the day after Father's Day, I should say. But uh, especially on June 19th, as you see this retro review going up, there is one more coming on July 19th. And Cecil and I here are still hoping that we get uh, some early press tickets nailed down for The Dark Tower. It's not super horror centric. And unfortunately, with some of those crossovers, we don't have guarantees. But I look forward to bringing you a review along with George Ash Canyon, Sarah, Wagstaff, and Cecil Laird, who are all three on that panel that I did for the Phoenix Comic Con. We're going to get that contact back together for the film review, which is going to be a whole lot of fun one last time around, my friends, right? So until then, I must say hasta luego, sin amigos. I hope that it is sooner rather than later, and until the Wheel of Ka comes again one final time. For the Dark Tower 7, the Dark Tower, stay scared and read Stephen King. Especially the Dark Tower. It's worth your time. It's a lot to dedicate, though. <laughs>